Today on Motley Fool Money, we're hitting the slopes. Okay, we're not actually going skiing, but we are digging into Vail Mountain Resorts to see how the business is doing. That and more coming up right now. I'm Chris Hill, joined by Motley Fool senior analyst Tim Byers. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks for having me, man. We've got the latest on financials and 5G as well, but we're going to start with the changing landscape in the entertainment industries. On yesterday's show, we opened with Microsoft continuing their history of strategic acquisitions, buying Activision Blizzard, a clear shot at meta platforms, uh, and in their bid for the metaverse. One of the ripple effects involves Sony, because shares of Sony have dropped more than 10% uh, since this move was made by Microsoft. Let's start with PlayStation. Is, uh, is PlayStation that crucial? I know it's part of Sony's business. Is it that fundamental to the business? And is it so threatened by a combined Microsoft and Activision Blizzard? So I think the answer to this is yes and no which is a horrible way to answer a question but let's take let's take the yes the yes portion is as of right now the game and network services portion of Sony's business is about 30% like it's about 30% of Sony so it is meaningful PlayStation is important so in some ways yeah the the sell off and the fear is a bit justified here because this makes the Xbox a much more attractive platform. And in a couple of ways, it makes it an attractive platform for buyers, but it also makes it an attractive platform for developers. And a game developer does have decisions to make. When you are writing for, when you're developing a game, you do have to decide where you want to target that game. Are you going to target it at PlayStation? Are you going to target it at Xbox? Are you going to target it? to the cloud, you're going to target it to mobile. So a developer does have choices to make. And so I think for Sony, their platform becomes a little less attractive today. And in that sense, yeah, it's a big deal. On the other hand, I mean, come on, do we really believe that the PlayStation is going away and that this means that all new exciting games from independent studios are going to go to Xbox first all of the time? No, I don't believe that at all. In fact, I believe that there will be plenty of PlayStation exclusives, PlayStation reveals. Sony also has a very big entertainment and a well-diversified business. So, I think the Sony response, whatever it is, Chris, is going to be fascinating. Well, and you and I were talking earlier, neither one of us thinks that Microsoft is not going to have this deal shot down by regulators. Regulators right. will have some tough questions, as they should, but all the more reason for Microsoft to put themselves in a position where, you know, if you're a regulator, isn't one of your questions about PlayStation, because there's a version of this sure. where Microsoft takes a ton of new games, makes them exclusive to Xbox, and slowly PlayStation withers on the vine. Yeah, that that is a question, right? And a regulator, like here's the, you know, the 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 question from the senator from Connecticut is, <laughs> will Call of Duty be an Xbox exclusive, you know, game from here on out? And the answer to that better be no. And of course, it will be no. Because Microsoft isn't just selling Xboxes. In fact, hardware, I would argue, is the least important aspect of the Xbox business. The bigger aspect of the Xbox business is the software, the licensing, and I think most important of all is the franchising. Because what Microsoft bought here isn't just really good games, they bought really good brands. They bought Candy Crush, they bought Call of Duty, they bought Overwatch. And these are a bit more transcendent brands. And gaming has kind of become, in a lot of ways, I think, Chris, the new movies. Like when you are 
interested in, in something, you know, you're getting yourself involved in an entertainment franchise, games, I think, are the, the first line of uh, choice for somebody who's getting into a new entertainment franchise instead of maybe getting into Disney Plus, which Disney Plus is amazing, right? And those are good franchises. But gaming franchises are very important. They're growing in importance. And Microsoft's got some really big ones. I think if you were to diminish Sony a little bit, I would say Sony doesn't really have the same degree of franchises that Microsoft has got now with this deal. But yeah, I, I no other company amongst the big tech companies could get away with this deal, but Microsoft gets away with this deal because gaming is such a small part of its business. I like to think that the senator of Connecticut is asking that question because he owns a PlayStation and he doesn't want to have yes. to shell out money for an Xbox now. 100%. Let's stick with entertainment. Uh, YouTube is shutting down its original programming division. And I saw that headline, and I was reminded that YouTube has an original programming division. Um, I, I, it seems like this was always the way it was going to go. For all, what do you think when you when you hear something like that? Because one of the things I think is, I'm amazed that YouTube is still, as a business, as dominant as it is, as big as it is, as a business. It's not performing the way that the people who run Alphabet would like it to run. I love that you just basically called out YouTube original programming as the quibby of streaming. Like that is that is amazing, but also accurate, factually correct. I mean, did we can you name a YouTube original program? I cannot. I cannot. So it doesn't surprise me that this is going away. And frankly, YouTube is known for short form programming. It's known for clips, it's known for recaps. And that's what we love about it. Here at The Motley Fool, we do have something for our team, particularly on the analyst team, where uh, we can get the uh, subscription. That allows us to get rid of the the YouTube ads, so I can go in and watch, say, like a conference, an investor conference. No ads. I just get the full, you know, experience of it. And in fact, I did this. I watched the AMD presentation at CES, and it was great. Like you get the full forty minutes, all of the uh, all of the discussion of what's going on, and it's a much better experience. That's actually worth paying for. So. The fact that YouTube is getting rid of original programming, I honestly, Chris, think this is good news for Alphabet because original programming is expensive and it takes a long time for content to have a really long life. Like before, you have to invest quite a lot up front to create a content franchise. And then on the back end, the returns on that, if it really hits, are amazing. But the upfront cost is immense. So now YouTube gets rid of that cost. They build out their network and they do what they've been doing wonderfully for a really long period of time, which is take other people's content, repurpose it, and give them a platform. I think it's a good move. Last thing before we move on, I think if you're a shareholder of Alphabet, it's one more reason you have to love that Ruth Porat is the CFO. 100%. Because Alphabet makes so much money. Yes. And, and the problem with businesses that make so much money is that some people, both inside the business and outside the business, say, well, we can try all these other things because we've got this golden goose. And and that will just subsidize everything else we do. And with Alphabet, Ruth Porat is putting a timeline on these things. You know, there's a version. Right. If if someone else is the CFO or the leadership makeup uh, is a little different, they say, yeah, let's keep going. Let's let's keep doing this. They gave it a shot and it didn't work. Right. She's stone cold. I love Ruth Porat. She is a Jerry Maguire CFO. It's all show me the money. Right. You've got to show me the money, and if you can't show me the money, sorry. I, and uh, that is what you want from your from your CFO. You want to be able to run a lot of experiments, run them with a very low cash outlay. If you can get away with it, 
give the experiment a certain period of time. And if it's not delivering returns in that period, you want to shut that down. This is something, by the way, it, it is an underappreciated cultural aspect of Alphabet. And I think they've lost it in the last few years. So it's heartening to see it coming back, Chris. It used to be that the pre-Alphabet days, back in the Google days, Google would run an enormous number of experiments. And sometimes they would kill those experiments when they were popular. Like I remember being an early user. I'm going to date myself here. I was an early user of Google Notebook, and I loved Google Notebook. And they killed that thing because of Evernote. And I was devastated because I'm just a nerd that way. But it was the right move to make. It was the right move to make because it wasn't a big project that was returning cash to the company. So it's it's heartening to see this where they're going old school, running experiments, and then ending them when they should be ended. Two more things I want your thoughts on before I let you go. SoFi Technologies won regulatory approval to become a bank holding company. Shares of SoFi are up more than 12% today. How much more attractive does this make SoFi's business? Because this was not a stock that was on my watch list before, and I'm not sure regulatory approval to become a bank changes that. Yeah, I think this is a shrug emoji. Chris, I really do. I, I, this, and by the way, name another bank that has technologies in its name. You know, that's kind of interesting. But no, I don't think this is a massive deal. And the reason I don't think it's a massive deal has really nothing to do with SoFi. It's the nature of banking itself. I think that banking is changing dramatically. We are moving to a, a period where at least a portion of banking is done through apps. And so, in an app first banking world or an API first banking world, where you don't really need a banking relationship as long as you've got the app and the app acts as your bank and it becomes where you get your money, where you withdraw your money, where you send your money, and most of this is driven through the app. Like, for example, I really believe that Block, the company formerly known as Square, and its cash app, I believe that is reflective of what a future bank looks like. Now, it's not the only one, right? But cash app as a banking experience, I think for a, a younger, modern consumer, that becomes like your banking interface. So, SoFi becoming a bank is it's a checkbox item, but what else do you do to attract a customer and say, you should bank with us, other than give rebates, incentives, and things of that nature? So, no, I think it's a bit of a shrug emoji. It doesn't mean that SoFi is a bad business, but I don't think it materially changes its fortunes, Chris. Today's the day that Verizon and AT&T are switching to 5G service nationwide, except reportedly near airports because of yes. concerns that high-tech radio signals could interfere with the navigational systems on some aircraft. I, I got to be honest, Tim, as a guy with a mobile phone, I didn't care all that much about this story. As a guy who occasionally gets on an airplane, yeah, you care a lot, I'm, don't you? Now I'm really interested in this story. Where, yeah. Where, where do we go from here with 5G? Well, where we go is to major metropolitan centers, and there are going to be places where 5G is going to be blacked out. The interesting thing about this story is it's terrifying and a non-event. The reason it's terrifying is like I'm I'm reminded of again I'm dating myself but there's a very uh, old show now I can't believe this is an old show but it's an old show now because it was from the late 90s called The West Wing which I loved that show and there is an old episode in which um, one of the characters is on an airplane and making a call on his mobile phone and the the flight attendant is telling him he cannot make a call on the phone because it's going to interfere with the navigation system and he goes on a screed about the modern navigation systems of the you're, are you telling me i can take that down with this little flip phone and the answer is probably not but at the same time it is a real thing like bandwidth and frequencies 
you don't want to be interfering with navigation systems on aircraft. So I do get that. And there are also blackout zones around major metropolitan airports. I remember there being one when I lived in the Bay Area. There was one around uh, Moff Field near. That may be more to do with defense than than actual, you know, aircraft. But at the same time. I, this is not necessarily new, but it does speak to some of the specialties of 5G because fi- what's interesting about 5G is that it's very high frequency. It's it's a very high bandwidth uh, type of communications uh, protocol. Like you're sending a lot of data over a very kind of shorter digital pipe. So yeah, it makes sense to me how we're going to design 5G networks will be fascinating to me, Chris. I predict it'll be more uh, more antennas in tighter spaces, which means more cities, less rural areas. So yeah, don't expect 5G around airports anytime soon. But if you live in a city, I think 5G is going to be kind of a game changer. So yeah, I- interesting. Not too surprising though, right? Since you confessed uh, to your nerddom, I will confess to mine. Uh, I'm also a big fan of the West Wing. It was the pilot episode. It was Toby Ziegler, and he had the great, uh, uh, you know, sort of ending to that screed where he said, "Are you telling me I can take down this plane with something I bought at Radio Shack?" That's it. Yes. (laughs) Well done. Well done. Yes. That's that's it exactly. Right. Right. Talk about multiple old school references in one quote right there. Tim Byers, always great talking to you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Chris. Among the people who follow individual companies most closely are local beat writers. John LeConte is a reporter for the Vail Daily Newspaper in Colorado, and he follows Vail Mountain Resorts, ticker symbol MTN. Our producer, Ricky Mulvey, caught up with LeConte to talk about Vail's difficult holiday season, how the company thinks about its labor shortage, and a climate change assumption that investors should pay attention to. Why are investors feeling a little bit more pessimistic about Vail right now? Uh, they sold 2.1 million pre-purchased tickets. That's a 76% increase over the 2019-2020 season. You have more people going to the parks, hopefully spending more money. Uh, but it seems there's a little bit more negativity right now. Vail is kind of unique in travel and leisure right now as um, they're, they're underperforming. And the people who our investors in this company uh, also ski and visited the Vail Resorts properties over the big vacation period and could could see a visible decrease in the quality that they had grown accustomed to. Vail right now is having a huge labor problem. You could call it the labor shortage. Uh, it could be because maybe they're not paying enough uh, to some employees. What what's the problem with the labor shortage in Vail? Is it um, are there simply less people willing to work on the mountains, or are they finding it unaffordable and they want to work on the mountains as um, ski patrollers and chair operators, that sort of thing? Yeah, I think the issue has been a long time coming. Labor has been tough in the mountain communities for a long time. Um, housing is hard to find, but yeah, just to make it up here in general is really difficult. And if you want to, you know, start a family, that's, you know, nearly impossible for a lot of people. If you're one of the lucky ones who gets a job at Vail Corporate, you can get ahead and you can get a a great job that you will, you know, make enough and be able to raise a family one day, but you're going to be moving around. So you're going to be bouncing around the country so people will opt out for that reason. Then at, if you're working for Vail itself, they can um, provide ways around uh, wages. Why do you need a wage when we'll provide your, your food, your housing, your bus pass, your ski pass, your ski equipment? And um, you know we'll, we'll even set up a morning calisthenics program for you to help you stay healthy and, and reduce your your health cost burden. So, you know, the resort can set up a lot of these 
systems to get around paying wages. So from their viewpoint, you know, why would they pay a wage? They're able to provide housing that is town housing, you know? Um, So they have a great system for them dialed in where you have government housing you're able to take advantage of. And if you get to a situation where, where that's full and, and some of that housing is now being used by other companies who are in the Valley, you know, we have, Lots of big players here, not just Vail, you know, um, Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, you name it. And so suddenly it, it just becomes really difficult to, to just maintain a, a labor force. Vail cut the price of its season pass this year by 20%. Ticket sales went up because of that. But is this something that might prove to kind of bite them later on is larger crowds may be decreasing the quality of experience for skiers and snowboarders? Well, what if the ski pass costs $5? Okay. How many would you sell? At some point you run out of skiers, right? So, you know, we're trying to figure out how many skiers are out there and it it varies year to year and you, you measure it by skier days. But in the U S we've, we've been getting to 60 million skier days over the last decade. And a skier day is just a day on the mountain. So maybe I might in a year contribute to a hundred skier days, you know, if I get out every day. And so we're up to 60 million in this country. So Vail selling 2.1 million pre-sold ski passes, they're trying to figure that out, you know? So they know, they know how many they'll sell when the price of the pass is, is $2,000 because that's what it was once upon a time. So over the last decade and in this, this era, we call the era of the mega pass where you get a, a pass that gets you everywhere in the country. In this era of the mega pass, we're, they're trying to figure out where is the price point to, so that every single skier buys a pass, you know? And who knows? I mean, maybe we, we very well might get down to $5 at some point, but uh, there, there are new, new problems associated with that. But again, with this stuff with the crowds, it's this year that, that somehow has been a, a magnifier of that. Because if you were to search the term lift line apocalypse, you would, you'd go back to the two seasons ago and see just as insane of lift lines as, as you've been seeing this season, maybe worse. Do you think the problem then is exasperated by social media? This is uh, the lift line problem and something that Vail takes very seriously. They've, and they're spending hundreds they, of millions of dollars on it, opening yeah. new lifts, improving the Epic Mix app to include these lift line forecasts. So do you think it's a little bit of an overreaction by social media? So first off, I'll say that if you talk to Epic Mix app users, they'll say that there has not been improvements on that app. They'll say that the app is a much compromised version of what it once was. And and the LiftLine forecast, that helps. But I think that Vail maybe, it's the social media aspect is magnified in their mind because they're, they're, they're on those feeds watching that stuff. But what, what, the, what the problem is, is that you, you have these skiers who they can ski any day of the year that they want. And now you've, you've got skiers. Everybody's good now. You know, everybody in Colorado who comes out and skis, they're all pretty good skiers now, you know, a lot of them. And, and, you know, we've all been shredding on this Epic pass for the last 10 years, getting as many days as we can and getting good at skiing. And now everybody only just wants to ski on the same day it's a, it's a powder day, you know, and, and we haven't had a powder day in three weeks, let's say, and all of a sudden one comes, the lift line is just going to get absolutely slammed. And so I don't see that as a problem for the ski season overall. Uh, I, I just see that as a, as an issue for certain times and for the, the perception of the ski experience, because like, I'll tell you, I never wait in any of those lift lines. I get, I find ways around those lift lines every single time. It's something that affects guests, you know, and people that don't really know. And to try to like get an app to help with that is sort of a classic like veil solution. Like, yeah, let's just 
come up with some technology to help this. But really, I think it's more in education, you know, and just saying to people like when the powder day arrives, the lift lines are going to be long and you're going to be waiting in them if you're trying to get out there. The other long-term problem that Vail could eventually run into is climate change, which may be shortening ski seasons for their mountains. Oh, God, absolutely. I mean, if you listen on these investor calls, they start off by saying, oh, and then we're just, you know, all of this projection that we're giving you is assuming, assuming normal snow conditions. So then you say to yourself, okay, Vale, what is normal snow conditions? Let's go to your website and check it out. Okay, you say on your website now that average snowfall per year is 354 inches. Vale Mountain hasn't received 354 inches of snow in more than a decade now. So if I'm an investor and I hear assuming normal snow conditions, and then I realize, wait a minute, you haven't hit that professed normal snow condition in the last decade. Yeah, I'm getting a little nervous here. I, I Of course. Last time they, they reached their 354 average, they got like more than 500 inches that season. It was the 2010 slash 2011 season. And it was this massive snow year. But then since then, it don't, Vail Mountain has only gotten over 300 inches of snow one time. It was like 310 or 315 or something like that. So they haven't hit their professed average. And the idea of an average is just getting thrown right out the window because you have these massive snow years and then you have these smaller snow years. Final question I have to ask you. We have a longtime fool. He wants to know where he can go ski in Colorado, where snowboarders will not bother him. Where should he go? Mm, I would say he can go straight to hell. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, John. Appreciate it. If you're just getting started investing or you know someone who's looking to get started, we have a free investing starter kit. It covers everything from how to set up a brokerage account to 401ks to buying your first stock. And it includes 15 stocks and five ETFs selected by our investing team. And it's free. Just go to fool.com slash starter kit. That's fool.com slash starter kit. You know what? We'll put the link in the show notes. That's all for today, but coming up tomorrow, Jason Moser and Matt Frankel will have a deep dive on a payments company that's probably not on your radar. Until tomorrow, that is. As always, people on the program may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear. I'm Chris Hill. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.